This is your news source evening bulletin for today, Tuesday the 24th day of November in the year 2020. I'm Gordon Mosley. Here's what we're tracking tonight. Guyana and Suriname today moved one step closer to realizing the plans to bridge the Quarantine River, which separates the two South American states. A memorandum of understanding was this morning signed in Paramabo, Suriname, between the foreign ministers of Guyana and Suriname for the bridging of the quarantine. President Irfan Ali and the government team are currently on an official visit to Suriname. During a joint press conference this morning, President Ali underscored the importance of bridging the quarantine river and creating closer links between the two neighboring states. Once constructed, not if constructed, the bridge will serve as a permanent physical link between the people of Guyana and Suriname. But more importantly, that link to the rest of South America continent. We recognize the enormous benefits that this can bring in the areas of tourism, transportation and trade. The bridging of the quarantine formed part of the discussions between President Ali and his Surinamese counterpart when the Surinamese president visited Guyana back in August for President Ali's inauguration. The issue is not new and had been discussed by previous governments in both Guyana and Suriname, but this may be the closest that the two sides have advanced the discussions. President Ali today said Guyana and Suriname intend to begin strengthening their relations as easier access to the two countries will deliver added results. We have, we have even expanded our discussion in areas where we can jointly promote business opportunities and tourism opportunities for both countries. It is therefore expected that the proposed road alignment will create within its vicinity the possibilities for free trade zone, enhance land value, and this, of course, will reduce the cost of doing business and increase the ease of doing business. Back in October, Guyana and Suriname demarcated the areas for the bridge on both sides. The three points of demarcation identified were Molson Creek, Longs Island in the Quarantine River, and South Drain in Suriname. Suriname's president, Shanton Toki, said he believes the cooperation between Guyana and Suriname will grow even stronger in the coming years, and both countries will benefit from the improved relationship. During our deliberations today, we have reiterated the importance of further deepening of the political dialogue at the highest level and to give direction to and monitor the bilateral negotiations and future undertakings in order to achieve tangible development results. The Surinamese president also said there is currently good momentum on both sides for the enhancement of sustainable development and cooperation. With the recent oil findings in both countries and the mitigation of COVID-19 pandemic, the momentum is there to target our focus on sustainable development and the resolution of the existing common challenges of two developing countries. President Ali and his team arrived in Suriname last evening on their three-day official visit. A number of other issues for cooperation at the bilateral level have already been discussed on the first day of the visit. More news coming up in just a moment. Diana, we've been through it all. But as a people, we have weathered every storm and risen to every challenge. Because it is the people of Guyana that gives it its strength. All the people, regardless of race, class, or religion, we, we are one people, one strength. And now is our time. A time to rise. Together, we rise. Mobile Special and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. Mobile Special and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. Ravinas and Water Street and Anans and Regent Street just received a new shipment of Lederet in over 16 colors. Lederet can be used in a wide variety of applications including covering speedboat seats, cargo, and keeping commuters dry. Ideal for minibus and car seats, Lederet can be custom made to your seating requirements. 
Leatherette is easy to clean and sanitize and a better choice during the COVID pandemic. For fast and comfortable shopping, visit us to get the best prices in town, Ravina's and Water Street and Anand's and Regent Street. That's a great start powered by Uasa Battery. Uasa Battery is the number one Japanese brand. It's durable, improved performance, maintenance free, and comes with absorbent glass mat technology. Uasa Battery, trusting starting power for over 100 years. Choose Uasa Battery for the best battery for your vehicles. Uasa Battery is distributed by JCA Trading Inc. Telephone number 231-9446-9. For all the Zoom hashouts and recipe tryouts, the world changed and we were right there. Standing with you, always near. Getting closer in so many ways. Laughing together as we face these days. And because we are Caribbean, we've got a special insight that tells us there's no need to worry, world. We'll be all right. Welcome back. Attorney at law and PNC reform member James Bond was this morning taken into custody by the police as the probe continues into the sale of government lands along the east bank of the Marara. In a Facebook post, Mr. Bond announced his arrest and indicated that he was asked to take a lie detector test surrounding the allegations that were made against him by two businessmen, Eddie Dulal and Avlon Jagnanan. The two claimed that Bond encouraged them to apply for land leases and later found purchasers for the land leases that they had been granted. Bond has described the statements by the two men as untruths. The two also claimed that he was paid millions of dollars in his capacity as their attorney for allegedly facilitating the transactions. Mr. Bond in a statement on his Facebook page this afternoon said he was moved from the CID headquarters and taken to the Brigdam Police Station, where he is likely to remain for the next 72 hours. He said he has no intention to seek bail since he has nothing to hide. Mr. Bond said he remains ready and willing to take a lie detector test, but that opportunity has not been provided to him as yet. The investigation into the land leases were triggered by the Attorney General Anil Nandlal, who claimed that the deals which included the flipping of the leased lands were illegal. The former head of Nissil was recently questioned after being taken into custody about some of the same land leases. There are reports this evening that the police also intends to seek the Commissioner of the Lands and Surveys Commission, Trevor Ben, for questioning about a number of government land leases under his watch. The crime chief, Wendell Blanham, is overlooking the probe for the police. The Commissioner and Chief Executive Officer of the Ghana Lands and Surveys Commission, Trevor Ben, has become the latest person to be hit by the PP Civic Government's firing squad. He has been told that his services will no longer be required at the Commission from the 4th of February next year. Ben's contract was scheduled to come to an end in March 2022. In a letter to the Commissioner and CEO, the Permanent Secretary of the Office of the President informed him that the termination of the contract is being done in keeping with Clause 8, which speaks of a notice being given in advance of the termination of the contract. Ben has been asked to return any property that may belong to the Lands and Surveys Commission.
Mr. Ben was asked to proceed and leave back in September and to also prepare a handover statement at the time. He was also asked to document the status of all pending matters at the Lands and Surveys Commission for the President. Ben was appointed to the Ghana Lands and Surveys Commission back in 2016. He is the former program analyst at the United Nations Development Program and is also a former senior land developer at the Commission. In the run to the last elections, he was criticized by the then opposition leader, now Vice President, Bharat Jagdeo, over a number of land leases approved by the government. But Ben responded publicly to the claims by Jagdeo and proved that the leases that he was questioning were all legitimate and many of them had been approved since under the previous PP Civic Government. Just after it got to office in August, the new PP Civic Government stripped the Lands and Surveys Commissioner from approving land leases, putting that power back with the President. Ben is credited with turning around the Lands and Surveys Commission by modernizing its system, remapping the country's state lands, using technology, and making the entity financially viable. Guyana has recorded its 147th coronavirus-related death. The latest victim has been identified as an 87-year-old man from Region 6. Since the start of November, the country has recorded 21 coronavirus-related deaths and 981 new cases of the virus. The number of cases has been climbing steadily with 35 new cases being recorded in the past 24 hours. Region 1 is seeing a spike in new cases in some communities and Region 4 continues to see the highest number of infections in the country. The Ministry of Health intends to step up its awareness campaign on the coronavirus pandemic as the busy holiday season approaches. The Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, today issued a call on business places to ensure that they have systems in place to safeguard themselves and customers against COVID-19. We want to um, really uh, talk to responsible citizens and businesses uh, to really come on board because we are going into the Christmas season and if we behave responsibly, we would be able to stabilize the amount of cases that we are having and you wouldn't see a surge of cases. But if we behave irresponsibly and we want to go to bars, we want to socialize, we want to be with friends, then we can easily see a spike of cases which can overwhelm our current health systems. Guyana has recorded more than 5,000 cases of coronavirus since the first case was recorded back in March. In response to the Private Sector Commission's defense of the Pam Coach Restaurant and Bar after it was warned for flouting the COVID-19 regulations, the National Task Force has indicated that more than 40 other businesses have also been warned. In its rush to defend Palm Court's continuous breaching of the COVID-19 regulations, the Private Sector Commission claimed that the business was being targeted, since there were other businesses that were also flouting the regulations. But in a statement, the National COVID-19 Task Force and the Ministry of Health revealed that they have issued 42 letters of warning to various businesses, including 20 final warning letters. The task force said it has never disclosed the letters to the media and it believes the situation could be addressed. The task force also said it sees the private sector commission as a valuable partner on the national task force and hopes the two will continue to work together in the coronavirus fight. The PSC had threatened to withdraw from the national task force because of the warning to Pam Court. With the National Task Force now indicating that several other businesses have also been warned and the PSC clearly in the dark about that, it remains unclear of the real role the PSC continues to play on the National COVID-19 Task Force. A Guyanese woman who was originally from Plaisance in the east coast of the Marara but now works in neighboring Suriname as a vendor was busted at a Chetty Jagged airport with more than 4 pounds of cocaine in book covers and various containers yesterday. The 42-year-old mother of seven has been identified as Tommy Ann Bunbury. She recently traveled to Guyana from Suriname and was preparing to board a New York-bound flight at the Chetty Jagan Airport on Monday when the bus was made by Kanu agents. In a statement today, Kanu said the woman has been living in Suriname for the past six years but would travel over to Guyana regularly. 
According to Khan, all cocaine was found stashed in the fake covers of books, the containers for makeup and other personal care items, and even in stationary items. All of the items were stashed in two suitcases that the woman had in her possession. The cocaine weighed just over four pounds in total, according to Kanu. Bunbury was immediately taken into custody and will face the courts soon. Former Guyana ambassador to China and retired Foreign Service officer Peter Winston Denny has died. He passed away at his Bel Air home early this morning at the age of 79. During his career as a Foreign Service officer, Mr. Denny served in Jamaica, Russia and China and later returned to Guyana where he continued his work with the Foreign Service Ministry until retirement. He also served as president of the Amateur Radio Society for many years. Across the Region is coming up next. Delvac and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. Mobile Delvac and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. of men standing strong but never too proud to stoop and help someone we must send a clear signal to all do right walk in upright ways knowing that's what being a man is all about and ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing stand strong be the one to live right but as a people we have weathered every storm and risen to every challenge because it is the people of Guyana that gives it its strength. All the people, regardless of race, class or religion, we, we are, are one people, people one, one strength. strength. And now is our time. A time to rise. Together we rise. Mobile Delvac and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. Mobile Delvac and all other mobile lubricants are distributed by Sol Guyana Inc. Across the region right now, Nation News in Barbados reports that Barbadian Prime Minister Mia Motley will address a two-day virtual Caribbean conference on corruption, compliance and cybercrime. The conference begins on the 7th of November. It is being hosted by the Barbados-based Caribbean Development Bank and the World Bank Group and the organizers said it will allow for leaders from across the world to share and discuss new challenges and solutions for corruption, compliance and cybercrime in the Caribbean. 
This set of speakers will include experienced global anti-corruption practitioners, anti-money laundering specialists, cybercrime professionals, development bankers, policy makers, regulators, law enforcement personnel, academics, private sector representatives, and civil society leaders. Apart from the Prime Minister, the conference will also be addressed by the CDB President Dr. William Warren Smith, the Vice President of the World Bank Group, and Dr. Tucson Boyce, who heads the Office of Integrity, Compliance and Accountability at the CDB. In Trinidad and Tobago, the government there has announced a total ban on Christmas parties within the public sector and urged the private sector to do the same. It also announced a 30 million Trinidad and Tobago dollar initiative aimed at assisting persons who lost their jobs or have fallen on hard times as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. The Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley and the Health Minister Terence D. Elsing told the news conference that instructions will be given to the appropriate public sector officials so to ensure that government funding for Christmas parties over the coming weeks would not be entertained. Rowley said he was aware that many villas in Tobago were fully booked for the Christmas season and while the government would not prevent people residing in Trinidad from traveling to the sister isle for the season, he was reiterating the need to follow all protocols and measures put in place to prevent the spread of coronavirus in Trinidad and Tobago. And finally tonight, international news. The United Nations has expressed concern about possible war crimes ahead of a threat by the Ethiopian army to start an assault on the northern Tigray region's capital. Fighting between Ethiopia's central government and forces in Tigray has been ongoing for almost three weeks. Hundreds have already been killed and tens of thousands have fled. Aid groups fear the conflict could trigger humanitarian crisis and destabilize East Africa. The UN said it was alarmed by the threat of major hostilities a day before the Ethiopian army said it would advance in Tigray's capital, home to 500,000 people. On Sunday, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia issued a 72-hour ultimatum to the forces in Tigray, telling them to surrender as they were at a point of no return. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting. <laughs>